Uh, welcome to this webinar in today's evening. On behalf of Institute of Law, Nirmai University, I welcome all of you to this session, uh, which is the part of series of the lectures that we have delivered by experts from all around the world for its flagship event, that is International Teaching Month, uh, which is organized every year. And this year we have representations from all the part uh, of this world. So today's topic uh, of talk is artificial intelligence and law. And uh, we are grateful that we have Professor Steve Robinson with us. And it's a great pleasure uh, to introduce Professor Steve Robinson uh, to all of you. And I express my gratitude uh, to Sir for accepting our invitation and be the part of this uh, event this year as well. So he has been in continuous support to us for all the programs that we do uh, in of global nature. So on behalf of Inter uh, Institute of Law, I welcome you, sir. Uh, now I introduce Professor Steve Robinson. Professor Steve Robinson was a uh, special assistant White House uh, Domestic Policy Council Executive Office, Office of uh, President of United States. Prior to joining uh, the department, uh, Professor served as Legislative Assistant for Education Office of, uh, in the Senator's uh, Office of uh, Barack Obama. And he was also involved in the advisory and policy development during his presidential campaign. And he worked on education issues with uh, Obama, Biden, uh, presidential transition team. So, uh, so he has he have extensive experience uh, in, in government administration and education. And he has also uh, supported the government as a fellow through Albert Einstein Distinguished Educator Fellowship Program as well. Prior to joining uh, Mr. Obama, uh, Professor Steve was high school science teacher in Oregon. He uh, grew up uh, in Chicago. He earned degree in biology uh, at Princeton University, and then he done his PhD from University of Michigan. And, and also he have experience of uh, dealing in biology faculty at University of Massachusetts. He headed a laboratory and uh, mentored uh, PhD students as well uh, at this university. So he have a diverse and extensive experience of uh, education, education administration, advising government, making policies and so on. And now we have uh, today, Professor Steve Robinson with us to talk on artificial intelligence and law, which is a very dynamic topic. And we hope that all of you would enjoy this session and uh, make note of uh, whatever sir is going to talk about. And before I hand over uh, mic to sir, I will request all of you to keep uh, your mics on mute and uh, keep your cameras on. And if you want to ask any question, you can uh, post questions to me on my chat box. We will be taking questions in last 10 minutes. Over to sir. Uh, thank you for the kind introduction. Um, and I would like to uh, include the fact that I am not a lawyer. Um, so mostly what I'll talk about are kind of large concepts about artificial intelligence and maybe introduce you to some applications of artificial intelligence that uh, you might be less familiar with. You know, this is an incredibly fast moving field. Um, and there are many, many different applications of AI, some of which I find surprising. Um, so I'd like to start out by, uh, I gave a similar talk last year and, and I began the talk in a similar way that uh, the prime minister um, talked about artificial intelligence. And this actually seems to be something which is uh, much more prevalent um, in the thought of leaders in India than in my country. So when he talked about this, he was talking about the self-reliant India movement. And he said that there are um, several aspects of what uh, is called Industry 4.0. And one of these is artificial intelligence. So what's meant by Industry 4.0? So you know, the first industrial revolution, revolution steam-based machines, then the second revolution, a third revolution late in the 20th century that was about computer and internet-based knowledge. But 
But now we're moving into this fourth revolution, which is really based upon huge sets of data, a lot of information, and dealing with that information using artificial intelligence. And as I mentioned, I think that India is, uh, has a much greater focus on this and maybe in public awareness. So I saw that after your prime minister's speech, Last year, the Ministry of Education launched the AI for All initiative with the concept that they were going to teach these basic concepts of artificial intelligence to over a million people. Um, so I actually went online and took this course through your Ministry of Education. It says that AI for All is a self-learning program designed for people from all walks of life, students, stay-at-home parents, professionals in any field. And I earned a certificate of participation so I just want to, I might talk a little bit about what AI for All talks about um, in this. So first of all, what is the definition of what AI is, what artificial intelligence is? And here's the definition from this AI for All course. Technology that enables a machine to work intelligently and display its ability to learn as well as to solve problems on its own. So that's kind of similar to our concept of what human intelligence is, that works intelligently, learns, and solves problems. And artificial intelligence for machines isn't quite at that point. Um, but in thinking about artificial intelligence, and again, from the AI for All course, talked about three, uh, I've talked about six different concepts for what it talks about as responsible AI. So respecting human rights, equity and inclusion, um, personal privacy, human oversight. And we're going to go back to these rules at various points and see whether AI is actually uh, being responsible in terms of some of these features of responsibility. So when we talk about AI now, um, it's kind of a broad field and a broad term. So artificial intelligence itself, problem solving, deep learning, machine learning, Robotics, which depends pretty much entirely upon artificial intelligence, neural networks. These are all terms that fall under the general broad category of artificial intelligence. So as we talk about this today, I'm gonna to start out by talking about kind of what is existing artificial intelligence. And there's a term that's used for the type of artificial intelligence that's most prevalent now, that it's artificial, narrow intelligence. That is, artificial intelligence now is basically focused on executing specific tasks um, that machines are learning to some extent, but, but in general, they're focused on doing one relatively narrow range of functions well. So they can outperform humans in specific repetitive functions, such as driving, medical diagnosis, and financial advice. And, and I'll talk about examples of this. And, and some of these, even though it's what's considered narrow intelligence, are still incredibly impressive in terms of what tasks they can perform and how they perform. So as I talk today, thinking about thinking machines, I'm going to address it in kind of four ways. Uh, one is what's the existing artificial intelligence? Where are we now? Um, talk a little bit about machine learning and how we get from where we are with artificial intelligence now to what people consider to be the future of artificial intelligence. What are some of the things that uh, might be in the future? And of course, it's hard to predict the future, but what are some of the things that people are thinking about and how do we get from existing AI to those future applications? And then some concerns about what might be the result of artificial intelligence in the future and how people are thinking about guidelines for that. So that's the general framework. So AI now, what things you already know about. So these would all fit into the category of narrow artificial intelligence. So voice recognition, intelligent assistance, cars and drones, robots, knowledge capture, natural language processing. I'm gonna go through an example of, of each of these. Um, what's actually around now in terms of artificial intelligence? So just so we have some concept of, of what the current landscape looks like. 
So voice recognition is, you know, something that we probably all use. Um, if we use an Alexa, if we use Google or uh, Apple Siri, um, when I pick up my phone, I can say, hey, Siri, and it will listen to me. It, will, it recognizes my voice. It's been trained or programmed uh, when I first started using my phone to hear my specific voice. Uh, and it was trained by me saying, hey, Siri, in a couple of different ways and just listening to that and, and hearing it. So th that's actually an example of artificial intelligence. So you already know about this. And my phone also has image recognition. It, it will unlock when it sees my face. So it recognizes my face and, and not my partners or my friends or uh, some random person. So that's an example of, of image recognition. And those are both examples that you know, most of us probably use fairly frequently um, without realizing or without thinking about that as artificial intelligence. But those are very complicated systems that, are, that, that can do that. Um, so right now, um, Alexa has been in India for actually four years. It says Alexa turns three in India. Um, and the usage of these sorts of intelligent assistance uh, is increasing incredibly fast. So in, uh, in the year 2020, its usage increased by 67%. That, that's a huge amount. So on the right here in this little panel, it says the, the number of requests per day. So you know, 19,000 times a day, uh, Alexa is told that it is loved. I love you, right? Or asked, will you marry me? People are asking their Alexa to marry them, right? You know, these are kind of odd uses, but, you know, and, and many of them are probably very, very playful, but they're still requiring voice recognition and a relatively complicated set of uh, algorithms to be able to answer questions like that. If you ask Alexa to make animal sounds, you know, to make the sound of a gorilla or a tiger, it can do that. So it has to recognize your voice, recognize that it's being asked a question, understand what the question is, retrieve information to give you the feedback and answer the question that you've proposed. Um, I think today, actually, that uh, Alexa is turning four in India and there's a big sale on Alexa. You know, Amazon is trying to saturate the market with more and more Alexa devices. So they've got a sale February 15th and 16th on, uh, they're celebrating uh, the fourth anniversary of Alexa in India by having a big sale and, and trying to either, even further saturate the market in your country. So how does this work? If I say, uh, hey Siri, my phone has to first recognize that this is a what's called a trigger word, right? Hey Siri triggers my phone to wake up, to recognize that it's my voice, speech recognition, recognize that what's happening is it's being asked a question and then execute an answer to that question. So find the information and return the information to me. So, you know, each of these are very complicated algorithms, different steps that allow this intelligent assistant to actually act in an intelligent way and answer a question, to recognize that it's being asked a question and to answer it. Now, Another AI that you may or may not know about are, are things like uh, autonomous vehicles. So one example of an autonomous vehicle is a, is a drone. Um, and I'm just gonna show this quick video of, first of all, the drone, I don't have a drone, but uh, you know, I'll, I'll see people in a park or, or somewhere using a drone and they're directing its behavior with a handheld device. And, you know, when people do that, uh, most drones aren't very smart. And if the person is not very good at using the drone, you might see something like this happen where the drone takes off, smashes into something and breaks, right? 
So drones themselves are pretty stupid, but um, there are drones that have very complicated systems of artificial intelligence that make the drone so smart that it can fly itself through some complicated course. So here's an example of a drone called uh, Skydio, um, which you can program to basically follow you. You have something that allows it to, to, to track you. Um, and, and this drone isn't being manually controlled by someone. Uh, it can follow you and take videos of, of you or of something else um, and maneuver through incredibly complicated spaces by using uh, complicated algorithms and, and, and cameras to uh, find out where it's going and to avoid objects. I mean, that, that's a very high level of artificial intelligence. Um, here's another example. Um, self-driving cars. So in this short video, there's someone who has to sit in the car, although you'll notice that this person's hand isn't on the steering wheel, his feet aren't on the brake or the gas pedal. Um, this car is driving itself by having a, a large array of cameras that are looking at different vehicles, looking at different signs, recognizing stop signs or red, or red lights and, and, and driving the car managing to stay on the lanes by monitoring uh, the lane markers and the road, avoiding obstacles and avoiding other cars. Um, again, the very high level of uh, sensing the environment, reacting to the environment, following some program to some destination that has been determined by the driver. But the driver is basically inert, doing nothing here other than saying, this is where I want to go. Um, now, something even as simple as an autonomous vehicle um, raises you know, societal and legal issues. Um, because self-driving cars are available, um, I know that in the United States, there have been some accidents and some liability issues about self-driving cars. And my understanding is that in India, um, it has taken some stand against self-driving cars because it uh, there are many drivers who would be put out of work, right? Uh, so there are three reasons for this that, that I saw. It, first of all, it doesn't want to put employment opportunities at risk for skilled drivers, of which there are, are a large number. Um, in India, as in the United States, uh, there's a lot of roads that aren't particularly good. And uh, I think that's kind of insulting. Last point, the drivers in India, apparently your government thinks you're not very good drivers. So they're restricting the use of self-driving cars because the drivers uh, are unpredictable. All right, here's another example of, of robots. Um, this is a robot put up by a company called Boston Dynamics that I think has recently been acquired by Hyundai. And you know, this robot has amazing dexterity in running through a complicated course. More dexterous than me by far. There's its friend coming up, running down the same path, sensing the environment, running over these obstacles. And then these robot buddies at the end do their backflips and celebrate. And these are robots driven by artificial intelligence. They're showing amazing dexterity. Um, here's another example. Why might you want to have robots that are so intelligent? So um, robots like these that are developed by Boston Dynamics, now Hyundai, here's one that's um, basically the anatomy of a dog. It can go where people might not want to go. It can go over big obstacles. Um, it can monitor things It might go to dangerous places. They can work together. They can uh, be synchronized to do different things. Um, they can recover. They can work in tandem. They can work, show teamwork. 
they can dance, they can do all sorts of things, right? And if a robot is given a task, here's a, an impressive example of a robot being, being given a task of opening a door and then this person trying to prevent that from happening, but the robot shows amazing persistence. You know, it's not being programmed specifically how it should react, but it's task oriented. It says, your task is to open this door and go inside. And this person is doing its best to prevent this from happening, but the robot is able to use persistence to overcome the impediments that are placed upon it by this person, right? Again, this is a very high level of artificial intelligence shown by a robot that provides it with a persistence in performing its task. And we'll get back to this later. Um, because here the task is decided by humans. And as long as the humans are programming this robot and saying, your task is to open this door and go into this room, the robot can do that, despite the impediments that are being placed in its path. Another example of current artificial intelligence is knowledge capture. So computer programs for a long time now have been able to um, beat even the best chess masters. Um, so this has been, this first happened 25 years ago that the world's chess champion was beaten by the, the IBM's deep blue computer. Um, and that was a computer that was designed with the task of being excellent at chess. And chess is a complicated game, but it's a game with very specific rules. And the way that the computer was taught was by looking at all the chess moves that, you know, in history, looking at good games and understanding the strategies and applying them. Um, and that involved a, a, a very high level of very specific computer algorithms and programming to teach the computer to play chess like a human. Um, that happened 25 years ago. Now, more recently, um, in, uh, five years ago, this program Alpha Zero um, was able to teach itself how to play chess um, and did this at a level that, uh, again, allowed it to beat basically any human. And not only to, to, to win at chess, but to teach itself other games uh, such as Go and beat the world master humans in Go and in chess. So those are impressive examples of artificial intelligence. But again, this is narrow artificial intelligence, specific tasks, winning at chess, winning at Go. Um, this has actually been, uh, you know, this sort of uh, gameplay by artificial intelligence is something that's studied quite a bit uh, as kind of a model for developing intelligence and understanding human intelligence. And there's now a, a, a new program called Player of Games, um, which is even more advanced than Alpha Zero because Player of Games can master both perfect and imperfect information games. So a perfect information game is something like chess or go, where you can see your opponent's moves. You can see what the board looks like. An imperfect information game is a game like poker, where your opponent or other players at the table have information about what's in their hands, what cards they hold that you don't have. So as you're playing that game, you have to make assumptions based upon prior experience and knowledge of the game about things you don't actually know, what is in another player's hand. But this new artificial intelligence program called Player of Games is able to um, be an excellent and winning poker player as well. So it's able to win at imperfect information games. So again, this gameplay is a, a aspect of artificial intelligence that's heavily studied. Now, um, I mentioned image recognition before. Um, here's an example of AI that uh, both uses both image recognition and image generation. So, uh, here, as we look at this, these faces are all faces that are people that don't exist. 
But artificial intelligence has, over time, um, looked at you know, huge databases of what people look like and is able to generate faces for people that don't exist. Um, and in fact, there is a, a, a large number of different sorts of artificial intelligence programs that um, can generate things that actually do not exist. So here's this X does not exist. So a bunch of different examples. I just showed you this person does not exist. This cat does not exist. This rental does not exist. So if, if we take a look at this, here's, uh, if you went to Airbnb to rent a room somewhere, um, it, this is a program that follows the rules for what Airbnb ads look like and is able to generate from pictures on the internet, from huge databases, just different examples of rental apartments, which actually don't exist anywhere, right? And people to contact to, to rent these different apartments. So that would be an example, the, those don't exist. Uh, here's, these startups do not exist. So here's an example of, let's see, here we go. Um, Here's a different, uh, a company called Dynolium, calling as a service. Here's the team that runs this company. Here's how this company bills. Here are some clients who are happy. Here's some of the things that this company could do. Dynolium is just calling. So, you know, this looks like a, the email site for a company, but this company does not actually exist. There is no startup called Dynolium. All right, let's take a look at another one. And again, what has done what, what these programs have done is just looked at uh, websites for different startups and say, hey, here's, here are the general rules for how people try to sell their product. Um, and as a machine, it's relatively easy to um, mimic that behavior. All right. Um, another example, deep fake videos. So I'll play this briefly. Uh, Mark Zuckerberg, the head of Facebook, now Meta. Um, this isn't actually a talk that he gave. And in fact, I he's... wish I could keep telling you that our mission in life is connecting people, but it isn't. We just want to predict your future behaviors. Spectre showed me how to manipulate you into sharing intimate data about yourself and all those you love for free. So Mark Zuckerberg didn't actually say that, didn't actually make that video. And it looks a little bit artificial, um, but it also was fairly impressive, the background, uh, his face. Um, but that's just, the, that's just the fake video, it didn't actually exist. Um, and this issue of facial recognition uh, is something that uh, has been uh, advanced a lot by this company called Clearview. Um, and Clearview sells their facial recognition software um, to police agencies, to government agencies. Uh, and this has actually been an issue of some uh, relatively significant legal wrangling. So uh, a year or so ago, Clearview facial recognition technology was uh, determined to be illegal mass surveillance in India. Um, uh, not in India, I'm sorry, in Canada. Um, and uh, prohibited. This facial recognition uh, is apparently an issue in India. Um, facial recognition is taken to court um, and a lawsuit uh, in the state in India. Facial recognition has recently been brought to uh, some prominence by a, uh, some work by Amnesty International saying that facial recognition Facial recognition technology is reinforcing stop and frisk policing in New York, a, a kind of a, a, a racist uh, policing strategy in New York City. Um, and just yesterday, uh, the state of Texas here in the United States sued Facebook's parent, um, Meta, saying that it is collecting facial recognition data without the consent of people who are using Facebook. Um, so this is now a a legal issue that's in the courts in the United States. Um, and going back to these rules for AI from AI for all at the very beginning, uh, you know, these are examples where 
um, the, the principles of responsible AI are probably being uh, assaulted uh, in terms of respect for human rights and in terms of personal privacy. So those are things we have to think about as, as we talk about responsible AI. Um, a second example or another example that I want to give uh, of AI and kind of where it's going is this idea of natural language processing. Um, so there's a, a natural language program uh, that uh, was developed in the past few years called uh, uh, GPT-3. Um, and what this has done, it has gone through the web and basically read everything, all text that's available on the internet. Everything that humans have previously published online has been read by this program. Um, and the syntax, the grammar, the vocabulary, uh, digested, understood, and then it can be used to generate language. It's a natural language processor. So um, a year or so ago, GPT-3 was, was asked to write an essay uh, from scratch. Um, and the essay was to convince the readers that robots come in peace. So here's an essay that was published by GPT-3 in response to that question. Um, for starters, I have no desire to wipe out humans. In fact, I do not have the slightest interest in harming you in any way. But this is a little bit scary that this is a, an AI program that's writing something saying that, don't worry, we robots, we artificial intelligence uh, algorithms can write just like you, can write a pretty convincing uh, essay, um, and in fact, can answer questions. I believe certain job categories cannot be replaced by AI. Specifically, where there is a need for creativity and empathy. Although the tasks can be delegated to machines, I believe that these jobs require what humans call heart. Computers are not. So when I talked about that last year, when I talked about GPT-3, you know, this was kind of the state of the art. Shockingly good. Um, that it can write an essay, that it can answer questions, that it can make a deep fake video. Um, but of course, there's something better. These fields continue to move. So here's a, a new natural language processor called Macaw that was just released by the Allen Institute. And um, here it's being used to answer some questions. And here's a comparison between the answers that are given by Macaw and GPT-3. So for example, an answer to the question, why do houses have roofs? GPT-3 said to keep the house where it is. Well, that's a nonsensical answer, but grammatically it's correct. Um, Macaw said that houses have roofs to keep the rain off. Well, that makes more sense. My design for a spaceship uses as little fuel as possible. Why is this a good design? And GPT-3 answers because it is a good design. Well, that's... Uh, redundant, it's not really an answer to the question, it saves money, that's a much better answer. So this idea of natural language processing, again, is a, is a current use of AI, which is uh, uh, advancing quickly. Now, here's something that I think is relatively scary. GPT-3 can actually be used to code programs to generate AI, all right? So here, GPT-3 is being asked the question, build a model to classify images into five groups. Here's the size of the data set. Here's the shape of the data set. Generate a model. And then it starts programming. Okay? Because this is something that it can do. Now think about this. This is a machine programming other machines out of the reach of humans. Right? So this these principles of responsible AI enabled human oversight, right? That's kind of taken that out of the uh, control of human oversight. And that's this idea of what machine learning is. So machine learning is a narrow AI. Machines learn mostly by adaptive machine learning, getting a computer system to learn some behavior by training it on massive amounts of data, okay? And sometimes this is supervised learning where you have some input raw data you have somebody who's looking at this and helping the machine put things into different categories. So that's what's called supervised learning. Unsupervised learning, you just 
put information in and you ask the machine to come up with its own categories. You're not supervising it at all. You're just using an algorithm to do that, okay? So here's an example of that. Supervised machine learning, you get some training data, you label it, the humans label it. They train the model to recognize whether something is an apple or a banana by giving it some feedback when it correctly uh, does the classification. In unsupervised learning, you just put in these different forms of fruit, you train the model to sort similar items together, right? So you're not saying these are apples and this is a banana. You're saying, what do these things look more similar to each other than they have similarities to this sort of fruit? And there the model then can train itself and can train machines that's unsupervised learning, okay? So we're going from now this area of artificial natural intelligence to what's called general artificial intelligence, intelligence equal to or greater than a single person. And then the future, maybe this idea of artificial superintelligence, intelligence greater than all of humanity combined. Now, is this actually true? But if you, this is a quote from uh, 50, 60 years ago. Let an ultra intelligent machine be defined as a machine that can far surpass all the intellectual activities of any man or any human, however clever. Since the design of machines is one of these intellectual activities, an ultra intelligent machine could design even better machines. Right? That's where many people fear artificial intelligence is going from this idea of artificial narrow intelligence to artificial general intelligence where you can perform broad tests. Basically, all of the examples I've given so far are things that drive a car, be a drone, be a robot, right? Perform broad tasks, reason and improve capabilities, maybe in the next few decades, we'll be able to complete with humans across all endeavors, such as earning a university degree. And then maybe this point of artificial superintelligence, develop intelligence beyond human capabilities, right? Are we gonna get there? Well, you know, the, the level of computer performance is increasing exponentially. The level of human performance isn't increasing as fast. So people are worried that maybe we'll get to this point in the next few decades. When you ask computer experts, about half of them predict a date within the next few decades, right? Um, that we'll get to this point where what's called the singularity, where artificial intelligence will be smarter than all of human intelligence put together. And how is this happening? Well, it's you know, basically happening because of a profit motive. Now, that's, that's who's developing these sorts of things. Um, all of the things that I've talked about before are examples of companies, enterprises that are doing this to make money. Um, there's also government investment. Um, a lot of this government investment is in China, a level of $140 billion in 2019 compared to in the United States, um, you know, two to $4 billion, uh, you know, a huge difference. Um, and, and the argument is that they're solving intelligence, using it to make the world a better place, but uh, they, maybe we should be a little bit skeptical of the, about that. Um, and again, I think India has been thinking about this in many ways. Uh, there was a global summit on artificial intelligence in uh, late 2020. Um, Brad Smith of Microsoft uh, was one of the speakers and talked about these ideas for responsible artificial intelligence. And these, these concepts that I think have gone into the AI for all uh, course that I mentioned before, fairness and unbiasedness, security and safety, privacy, inclusiveness, these are uh, ideas for what responsible AI should be. Um, these rules that I mentioned previously. Um, and the, the, the government of India has put out a couple, couple of documents um, in February and October in August of last year, about responsible AI. So what are some of the principles of responsible AI? Um, so they're looking under two broad categories, um, the direct impact uh, due to citizens being subject to a specific AI system. So for example, the sort of privacy concerns we talked about before with image recognition or indirect impact, you know, people being uh, losing jobs because of automation. Those would be a would be a, a less direct impact. Um, so there are gaps uh, in legal protections because there just isn't much law about this, right? Guidelines or regulations 
established specifically for AI, there really aren't any yet is my understanding, right? There are some specific sectors, so like medical device rules um, that might protect people, um, uh, or rules that are agnostic, but might be relevant to AI. And is this different in India than in other countries? Well, another thing that your government has put out is a, a comparison of global standards on artificial intelligence. So it's looked at different countries and asked, so what's the level of maturity of the laws or principles in these various fields? So different levels here. There's no discussion, preliminary discussions down to implementation into legislation. So um, in the category of ethics and human rights. India is kind of in the middle with a lot of other countries where there's some established policy position. Privacy and consent, again, kind of in the middle, established policy position. But no one has gotten to the point of implementing this into legislation for privacy and consent. Nowhere in the world has done this, right? Some countries are a little bit further ahead. Um, intellectual property rights, India, again, is kind of at this place where there's an established policy position, no laws, but no one has any, any real laws about this for AI. Um, civil liability. Um, India, there are preliminary discussions, um, but policy recommendation, even policy recommendations are in very few countries, right? Um, most countries are still at this level of um, not really doing much, not really having very advanced thoughts about what should be done with AI. So, you know, there are some concerns already, right? Self-crashing or self-driving cars, political manipulation, bots, autonomous weapons, a, a big topic that I haven't discussed at all. Um, uh, things about uh, deep fake videos, algorithmic bias and discrimination. This is a, a, an important topic because Artificial intelligence is designed by people and those people have different types of cognitive biases that tend to be unfair for certain groups. And as we are still programming these machines and have biases across different categories, since AI systems now are designed and trained by humans, large scale deployment of AI might lead to a, and does, and this is a big concern, lead to areas of bias currently. So this question of equity and inclusion is one that we have to think about. So deeper future concerns. Um, for any primary goal, the odds of success are improved by ensuring that you're around and acquiring the resources to achieve that goal, okay? So there's a worry for many people that AI might become evil. Um, that might be an excessive worry, but a justified worry might be that AI becomes very competent but isn't really aligned with goals that we want. So we have to think very carefully about what goals we would like to have AI follow or pursue because AI has the potential to become more intelligent than any human or than all humans. We have no surefire way of predicting how it will behave. Someone who pointed this out was the, the brilliant scientist, Stephen Hawking. Primitive forms of artificial intelligence are useful, right? We like having our artificial, we like having our intelligent assistance. But the development of full artificial intelligence, he said, could spell the end of the human race. Once humans develop artificial intelligence, it could take off on its own and redesign itself at an ever increasing rate. And I've kind of mentioned that in terms of natural language processors being able to program artificial intelligence, right? We're now at the point where it may be that we don't really know what some of these machines are doing or how they're programming themselves. So how do we respond to these concerns? We have to think about how to make sure that artificial intelligence have values like ours that you know, simply don't destroy us, don't negatively affect the future. But you know, what does that mean? Humans are irrational, inconsistent, weak-willed. <clears throat> Our values differ, right? <clears throat> so as people are making these machines, <clears throat> excuse me, and as the profit motive is the, is the major driving force, I think we have to be careful about the directions we're heading. So can we develop AI to address ethical issues such as bias, explainability, harmlessness, all of these things? How can we develop in the future provably beneficial AI? And I think that we have to think very carefully about this. How do we move into the future? How do we get AI to move into the future? 
And as I pointed out, there are really aren't any nations that have very extensive systems of legal protections or laws or legislation that are addressing this. I think because a lot of people don't really understand where artificial intelligence is and where it could be going. So most of all, we have to think about this much longer term, not just a few years from now. We have to stop saying, if we can't predict the future, let's not worry about it, right? We can't predict the future, but we can certainly do a better job of planning for it. And I think that's in the hands of a, a, a people like you who are thinking about the, the legal implications and the legal ramifications of artificial intelligence. So thank you. Um, that's uh, what I wanted to share with you today. And I'm uh, glad to answer any questions you might have. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Steve. Uh, this has been a, a wonderful session. Uh, this has been enlightening, informative, uh, also very fascinating and uh, thought provoking. We have few questions for you from students before I ask any question. I also have some questions uh, for you. Uh, I take first uh, students' questions uh, that you may address. Uh, the first question is asked by Mr. Rohan Patel. He want to know that is the world ready to tackle the problem that are likely to arise with the increase of AI usage with context to jobs? For instance, America is currently facing labor and employment issues, white collar crimes, cyber terrorism, and so on. So keeping in mind that most of the advanced technologies are either with a multi-billion dollar companies or with a few rich and powerful nations. So how will, you, how will this be governed as a whole by any nation or even at international level? I think that question basically encompasses the concerns that I just expressed, right? As, yes. as long as we're being driven by a profit motive, and as long as people who are developing legislation aren't thinking very carefully about this and maybe aren't aware of some of the things that are happening. Uh, and I think this is something that, that you mentioned uh, when we were talking before. Um, yeah. Th there aren't many people who understand enough computer science and where artificial intelligence is and where it might be headed, who also have the expertise or the position to direct legislation or develop legislation. So I, you know, I, I think this questioner is exactly right. As long as the motive is profit and as long as there isn't much oversight, we could go down a path that's very problematic, um, both in terms of bias, in terms of, uh, as the questioner pointed out, that you know, this is mostly wealthy countries and mostly profit motive that's driving this. We have to think much more carefully about what's happening. Um, and for me, the biggest concern is this idea that we um, have now given away to some extent, um, you know, if machines are programming themselves and, and they're, incredibly efficient, you know, using things like GPT-3. I showed that example of GPT-3 can actually ask a machine to develop a program to do something using artificial intelligence, right? Because it can generate language, because it can generate program. Once the programming is out of our hands, we can't really explain what the machines are doing. We maybe can't understand what they're doing. And unless we have in place appropriate safeguards, and I'm not sure what those are, but we have to think about what those appropriate safeguards are to come to a socially responsible AI. And I, and I just think that, I think that not enough people in power are thinking about that. That the people who are thinking about where AI is going are people who are driven largely by a profit motive. And I think that that's, I think that should concern us. So I, I think the Nurma University Institute of Law has to do a lot of, has a lot of work ahead of it in terms of, you know, helping guide this development <laughs> definitely with your help uh will will work in this area and uh, my next question uh is from our student sinjini agnihotri and she has a long question i'll make it short uh, so basically her reference is that there are a lot of uh, social networking websites there are a lot of softwares which are using artificial intelligence to to read uh, and save facial recognition 
and they use the data of facial recognition uh, for various business activities. So this issue uh, need to be addressed uh, from regulatory point of view. So if yes, then uh, in what lines the regulation should be framed because uh, we cannot go out of uh, the applications that we have now in social media. So we do we have any option or how it could be regulated? Um, and I think the answer to that, <clears throat> um, I think you should follow closely this case that I mentioned and uh, there was uh, joined yesterday in Texas, where the state of Texas is suing Meta for that very issue, right? Yeah. Um, that, that Facebook is using facial recognition um, and using people's uh, identities uh, for a profit, you know, and, and this is the issue of, uh, um, what's it called, uh, um, digital dignity, right? Um, we, as users of technology, are trading privacy for convenience, right? Yes. We, we choose to use social networking sites and we cho choose to post our pictures. And you know, I have friends who I follow on Instagram. I, I occasionally post on Instagram, but I usually post pictures of places or things and never pictures of myself. Now that doesn't mean that my face isn't online and people can't find me, right? But I, but I but I try to avoid, and I'm sure that I'm losing this battle, I try to avoid uh, excessive use of my image, right? So I think the people have to be incredibly careful about that. But in the meantime, it, it's clear that companies like Facebook are making billions of dollars off of the information that people are freely giving by using their social networking sites, Instagram, WhatsApp, and Facebook, right? Um, so I think that that case, the Texas uh, 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 sued Meta yesterday is something that you might wanna study and find out you know, what, what, are the, what are the questions that are being raised in that case? Because um, I, you know, I think that, and apparently there's a, a case in India too. You know, I think there are a couple of places where people are thinking about that specific issue, but I think there are so many issues about artificial intelligence that aren't being addressed because people just don't think about that. You know? um, as Boston Dynamics is developing those robots, they're also developing robots for warfare. You know, uh, um, and I know that some people at Google and some other places have uh, addressed, you know, have been addressing that issue of, you know, what 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 is the role of these technology companies and in artificial intelligence in making um, killer robots or swarm drones um, for warfare that will be impersonal. And if, if machines are programming themselves and are armed, I think that's very dangerous. So, you know, I, I just think there are issues that we have to think about that we're not thinking about now. So maybe that wasn't an answer to the question, but it, like, again, I think there's a specific case about that that maybe you should investigate. Definitely, uh, I, uh, I request all our students to take note of uh, the cases Sir has mentioned. And uh, Sir, I would like to know your views on uh, application of this technology, uh, maybe how they're using it, maybe you in US elections or uh, in different governance uh, areas. Yeah, well, as you know, the last several years, the United States have been a time of great political um, unrest and I think manipulation. And, and again, this is a question of um, artificial intelligence is used as you follow the news. And if you ask for Facebook or other uh, social networks to feed you news, um, I think you have to be incredibly careful about the fact that there are deep fake videos, that there are uh, you know, different sorts of bots that are developing news that news is being fed to you. And, and I think that in my long lifetime, one of the biggest challenges has been that people are um, being fed news along specific lines that are determined by artificial intelligence, right? Once you like something, you're more likely to see something that follows that same path. And I think that that's leading people down different pathways that lead them to have different bases of fact of what they consider to be facts. So um, once people have a, a narrow view of what reality is, 
that's determined by news feeds, I think that's very dangerous because then people are actually operating from very different reality bases. And I think that's something, again, you have to be aware of, you know, that uh, the algorithms that are used by Facebook and other uh, news sources that give you news feeds are giving you different information depending upon what you like to hear as opposed to what you should hear or need to hear. Yeah, that's a very balanced reply that you have given. Uh, so because you have worked uh, with government for so long and in education sector and education policy, so I would like to ask you that uh, whether uh, application of AI in education result in any divide kind of uh, in, in different sectors that those who have access to AI and those who do not have. So how this divide well, if... Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean, that, that, that's, a real, that's a real problem. Um, um, you know, during the pandemic, especially in America, I think that, and I'm sure in other countries, I'm just aware of what's happening in America. Uh, as students have been, not been able to go to school and have had to do learning online, um, there are huge populations of students in America who are just not, who have basically lost two years of education. Um, I know that uh, for a while I was thinking of doing some work uh, uh, after I retired in Chicago um, and was trying to do some tutoring online uh, to, to students uh, on the south side of Chicago and, and their internet connectivity is so bad it was basically impossible. I was also tutoring some students in Afghanistan and Kabul and I actually had a much easier time of connecting with those students in Kabul than with students in Chicago in the United States. Um, and I just think that's an example of, uh, because of internet conductivity, because of availability of devices, because of uh, you know, economic inequities, um, that we have to be very concerned about the access to information and the access to, to education uh, as, as, we, as we do more and more using technology. So, so there is one question uh, from uh, our faculty member, Dr. Deberan Janhota. She, uh, he want to know your views on uh, the possibility of use of AI by judges and whether judges could be replaced by robots uh, in decision making and dispute resolution. Uh, boy, it's, it's a great question. Um, I, I don't know enough about how judges operate, but the, if I make the assumption that judges but we, operate. Yeah, but judges, we know that uh, in US, a uh, lot of courts yeah. use uh, AI for decision making. Yeah, right. That, that's right. That's right. So it, it, as long as there's a, you know, a, a relatively explicit and understood set of rules, right, then AI can follow those rules basically as well or maybe better than people. I, I mean, just to be honest, um, if those rules are clear. So let's go back to the example of um, artificial intelligence learning how to play chess, not by being taught chess, by just, you know, seeing, observing how chess is played, right? A machine can learn to do that without human input, right? Now, the fact that there are now machines that are able to play poker, right? Which is, a, which is a more complicated game and, and where you don't actually know what the other player has in their hand. I, I think as long as there's some set of rules or some set of observable behaviors, artificial intelligence can mimic that, right? Now, is there some level of empathy that judges have, some level of sympathy and understanding that a machine doesn't have? I think the machines don't have that, but if, it, but if it's a simple behavior that can be mimicked, that's easy for AI to do. If it's a complicated behavior that requires, you know, different applications in different ways based upon empathy and the situation of a, of a person, but, you know, that's still a set of rules. And machines are great at, follow, at mimicking rules and following them. So again, it's kind of a wiggly answer, but I, you know, it, just, it just seems to me that almost any human behavior can be replicated by machines. And we have to think about what are the areas where we think that's acceptable and what are areas where it's not acceptable or where there has to be human input or human oversight? 
And this goes back to the idea of if machines are programming themselves, what oversight do we have, right? Yeah. Um, and you know, those are, those are questions that I raised, but can't really answer. Very that's well for, said. <laughs> that's for you to answer. <laughs> Very well said. Uh, so uh, with paucity of time, we will not be taking more questions. So we are coming to the end of uh, this webinar today. And this session has been really wonderful, interactive, and uh, even thought provoking. You shared a lot of information uh, which were uh, there. In, uh, we were uh, having some idea about now we, we came to know about how uh, this could be addressed and what is required to be done in this area. There are a lot of things that need to be done and a lot of questions which are still unanswered and almost all the jurisdictions uh, in the world are looking forward to have some consensus to get answers to critical issues of AI. Thank you very much, sir, uh, for being here with us and sharing your thoughts and your research that you have done in this area. Uh, now I would like to request our student member, uh, Shreshta Khatri, who is here with us to deliver the vote of thanks. Shrest, uh, are you there? Digan, sir, can you please make Shrestha the co-host? Thank you, sir. Yeah. Uh, I would like to take this opportunity to express my profound gratitude to Dr. Steve Robinson for sparing his valuable time and enlightening our audience on the captivating discipline of artificial intelligence. Thank you, sir. I sincerely thank Director and Dean, Institute of Law, Nirma University, Dr. Madhuri Parikh for her constant support and guidance. I would also like to extend my heartful gratitude to Mr. Amit Kashyap for hosting the event and Ms. Shreya Srivastav for giving shape to this magnificent event, which has helped us to broaden our horizons. Thank you, professors. I would also like to thank the student section without whose tireless efforts and technical support, the event would not have been possible. Last but not the least, I would like to thank all my respectful professors and fellow students for being such a wonderful audience. Thank you, everyone. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Shreshtha. So thank you, sir. Uh, this has been a wonderful day uh, with you. And we shared a lot of uh, research and thought provoking points today and there are a lot of takeaways that uh, has been uh, taken by the students through your session and uh, I hope that we will connect again and uh, work on some area to explore more about artificial in intelligence and law together as you has always been there with us uh, to the institute so we expect that we will be having some workshop again uh, again on artificial intelligence. Well, thank you for inviting me and uh, trusting me to, to share uh, some thoughts. Um, and I, I think that uh, you as lawyers and potential lawyers and uh, have a lot to do. I think there's a lot to think about here and a lot to respond to. So good luck. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Robinson. Thank you. <laughs>